my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body Him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance by heavy snow, Messiah still, and all alone. Sing, oh, praise the name of the
Oh 
Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening, a very warm welcome to you. It's great to see you, whether you're here in the tent or whether you're watching at one of our relay venues or joining us online. Now, if you've been in Keswick today, it's been a bit soggy, hasn't it? A little bit. Uh, now, we started this on Saturday night, so uh, let, let's have a go at this. Um, if you're from the north, have you had a good day? Yeah. Like it? Uh, if you're from the Midlands, have you had a nice day? Yeah. Not so much. Uh, and if you're from the south, have you had a good day? Yeah. And if you're from anywhere else, have you had a good day? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I think tonight, I think the north slightly wins. Yeah. But I think that's because you're used to this weather. And us soft southerners are not. Uh, it's great to have you. It's great to be together. You'll have noticed uh, this evening that Jody is not with us, uh, but I am delighted to be joined tonight by uh, Anna, who is co-hosting with me. And uh, Anna, you've been keeping a little bit of an eye, haven't you, on the, the social media engagement? I have. It's been great to have lots of people connecting with us on social media. Do do that if you haven't. Um, we've got a few snapshots to show you. First, this couple you'll see on the screen, hopefully. Um, they've been enjoying Keswick, take, sent us a great selfie. Um, they've had to go home, but they said they wish they could stay till the end of the week. Um, and secondly, we've got uh, June Woods with her grandson playing crazy golf. It looked like it was a bit damp. Um, they got their umbrella up, but looks like they've had a great time. Uh, and I'm sure lots of you have had similarly fun times in the rain and hopefully some not so wet times later in the week. Do be sending those in on social media. Um, you can use the hashtag keskonf22 or uh, tag us in your posts with at Keswick Ministries. Our theme this week is uh, the theme of gratitude. And in the evenings, we're looking at the Psalms. And tonight, we're delighted to have Paul Mallard, who is going to come and preach a little later. Uh, but as we begin, let me read a couple of verses from the Psalm that we're going to be looking at. Uh, and then I'm going to pray before we sing. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4 say this, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust, and I'm not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Let us pray as we begin our evening. Our Father in heaven, we want to be people who come again this evening in gratitude. We want to be thankful for all that you are and all that you've done. And we ask that you would fill us afresh with a sense of gratitude tonight. Would you meet with us? Would you bless us for our goods, but supremely for your glory? In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 As we heard yesterday, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. And that is true for all of us who have put our trust in Jesus. Let's celebrate that together as we sing. Please stand with us. Sing of our forgiveness. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. They laid him 
God above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. My name is written on his hands. My name is hidden in his heart. I know that while in every stands, no power can force me to depart. No power can force me to depart. Father, we thank you. We praise you that the forgiveness you've shown us in Jesus gives us access to you that we might call you our Father. What a privilege. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take our seats. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the Christian life was once described, wasn't it, as uh, a long obedience in the same direction. I've been a Christian this summer. It's been 23 years, and I was trying to think... Uh, well, I was wishing that I'd become a Christian in mums and tots because then I'd be slightly younger. But 23 years, and I have to say, every year has been hard. I don't know if you know, felt that in your Christian life. Every year has been hard. But every year has also been good. And in each of those years, there have been books that have been friends and teachers along the way. I remember the very first book you ever read. Um, Hudson Taylor's biography by Roger Steer. I remember exactly where I was when I read it. And along the way, books have been both friends and teachers. And it's why Keswick Ministries produce books to be those friends and teachers throughout the year to, to help us in that long obedience in the same direction. So let me highlight some of the uh, resources that Keswick Ministries uh, uh, produces. I think it was my brother who uh, gave me many years ago Peter Maiden's Discipleship Matters. And at home, I've got a marked and underlined uh, book, just really helpful. One of those, 
uh, teaching along the way. And uh, this is part of the, um, the Matters series. So there's Preaching Matters, Discipleship Matters, Mission Matters, etc. And uh, check out that, that series uh, and see how, how they may help you. There's also um, study guides for small groups and individuals to use. I wonder if your church uses this uh, as you perhaps have, have small groups or home groups. There's various different ones, Tim Chester on, on God's Word, but there's one on mission. There's obviously the, the one for this year on, on, on gratitude. See how your church might be able to use these to encourage people in, in their day-to-day -day, uh, discipleship. Then also, of course, there's um, uh, undated devotions so that you can work through Bible books, uh, but also topics. So this one on hope is new this year. 30 undated readings that Elizabeth McCoy has put together uh, for Keswick Ministries uh, on the theme of hope. There's also holiness and others. Uh, so do check those out. And you can get them together uh, as a one-year read-through, the food for the journey. Now, you're going to have to be quick because these are reprinting. So if you want this, uh, you need to head over. And then finally, um, a CD. Do you remember last year? It was the first time for, I quite, can't quite remember how long, that we could all sing together legally. And we recorded it. And uh, Ben and the band were involved. And Ollie Knight, who's here next week, he was there as well. And it was put together on a CD. And you can get that uh, in the bookshop. We'd love to get you that so that throughout the year you can be encouraged and challenged as you hear truth, both as you read it, but also as you listen to it. In fact, uh, why don't we do this, okay? Um, I need to tell the team that we're going to do this. If you spend £10 tonight, you can have this CD for free, okay? But tonight only. So if you're watching on the live stream, well, we'll see you tomorrow and it'll be good to see you. But uh, those tonight, okay, spend £10 or more, we'll give you the CD for free. But get some friends, get some teachers who this year, however hard it may be, can, can as it were, uh, cheer you along and, and point you in the way of truth as they point you to the Lord Jesus. Thanks. Last year's convention was just brilliant. We were finally able to meet in person after 18 months of lockdown. And we saw this place come alive with the hustle and bustle of young and old, seeing everyone gathering together as a community of believers on this one site. Well, today I am here and you may hear behind me the work continuing for this year's convention. Together, we have made great strides towards the five goals of the Derwent Project. We now have a fully integrated site and modern offices for the Keswick Ministries team. So much hard work has gone into developing this site to what it is today. So many prayers have been prayed and gifts have been given to make all of this a reality. The beauty of the Durham project, however, is it reaches far beyond the convention. There's an open invitation to gather at other times of the year for the growing teaching and training program all in the amazing beautiful Lake District. There are other events like the upcoming Churches Weekend Away. It's such a special place where congregations, youth groups, church leaders can take time out and come up here, be refreshed, equipped and inspired, and then go back to their homes, their places of work and ministry, and care for and inspire others. It's a once in a hundred year opportunity securing the site for future generations. And this year, of course, we've got young and old, all generations, all together here on one site. We are now so close to seeing this project completed. With your help, we have so far raised £6.8 million. That's 85% of the total, which is amazing. Think of the number of monthly donations and one-off gifts that we've received to reach this total. Thank you to everyone who has given so far. And we need a further £1.2 million to reach our 8 million target. And we're so grateful for all your support. Can you help us get over the line? Well, good evening. A very warm welcome to you. If you were here last week, the debate was um, 
whether we should wear shorts, and today is whether we, we should wear two pairs of trousers. So it's wonderful to see you. But what an encouraging video. We've just witnessed how much the ministry has developed. We really have made truly spectacular progress. And I really wanted to take a moment this evening to say thank you. To say thank you to everyone here and everyone watching online who has given so sacrificially to the Derwent Project. And your continued support has allowed the project to go ahead, step by step, floor by floor. And if you come on one of the tours, ceiling, uh, floor, in t floor tile by floor tile, which has transformed the once derelict building into a wonderful meeting place for the convention and the wider ministry. I'm often stopped in the town and thanked, thanked by townspeople that we've turned an eyesore into a gateway into the town. And all of this in the middle of COVID. So thank you so very much. If you haven't seen the pencil factory inside, please sign up for one of our tours through the building this week. You can get a ticket from reception. But I'm really here just to make a plea, like Jody did on the video, to help us get over the line. There is a gap in our fundraising to see the building project completed. If you see on the PowerPoint on the screen, you see a great big cheese. And you see the little green cheese. Not my favorite cheese, but you see a little green cheese. And that is how much we need to get over the line, 1.1 million pounds. But that's in context of 6.9 million raised by the generosity of folk like yourself. So thank you so very much. Practical ways could be if you do have an existing stand in order or a direct debit, to just to keep those going if possible. Thank you so very much. Or you could consider setting up a monthly donation of 20 or 30 pounds for the next six months by direct debits. On your way out, you'll be given an envelope. They're also available at the back. And would you consider signing up for one of those monthly direct debits or a one-off gift there will, inside, there will be a blue form, which is for the Derwent project, and a yellow form, which is for our operational fund. But above all, thank you so much. Thank you. God bless. Yeah. Well, there are three more events happening tomorrow, which may be of interest to different ones among you. Uh, so the first one tomorrow afternoon, we have uh, a mission personnel reception. It's going to be at 2.30 uh, in the pencil factory, floor two, room two. This is for you. If you're a, a mission worker and you're uh, kind of at home on leave for a little while, uh, this would be a great thing for you to come, meet fellow workers, share uh, and encourage one another. Do please just sign up at reception to let us know you're coming. Uh, secondly... If you want to find out more about the teaching and training events, uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, again, in the pencil factory, uh, in a slight change to the advertised uh, room there, uh, it's actually pencil factory, it's going to be the first floor but room two at two o'clock. There's just, there's such a brilliant range of teaching and training events that happen throughout the year, uh, and you may be aware of some of them, you may not, but can I encourage you, come and find out whether there's something there for you something for someone you know, something for your church. We'd love for you to find out more about those. And finally, tomorrow night, uh, we've got a concert in here after this meeting. Uh, we're gonna have David Lyon, Yvonne Lyon, and Gareth Davis-Jones. Uh, they are gonna be bringing songs from their new collaborative album entitled Trace the Line. That'll be in here after the evening celebration at 9.15. You'll be really welcome to stay and enjoy that. We're going to continue to praise God now ourselves. Uh, so let's stand as the band leaders. We sing together to the God who is our rock and our refuge.
can be hard, can't it, to sing in the midst of our suffering. And, and many of us here tonight will be facing all kinds of different painful trials. And it can be hard to be grateful and to find hope in those times of darkness. But brothers and sisters, there is hope for you because of the love of our Saviour. There is hope for you that goes beyond the grave. The Apostle Paul, who is a man who suffered terribly, would write to us, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. He writes that we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. And brothers and sisters, that day will come because of who our God is and what he has done for us in Jesus. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He will hold you. And if it's still too painful to sing that tonight, let your brothers and sisters lift you as we sing. He will hold you.
as we heard this morning, our suffering has an expiry date, but your love does not, and you will keep us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's such a good song to remind ourselves, isn't it? He will hold us faster. Maybe some of you, as Ben said, uh, this message tonight is going to be really powerful for you. In just a few moments, Paul Mallard is going to come and preach from Psalm 56. Uh, Paul is also this week kindly serving us by doing some seminars on gratitude. Uh, those are going to be running um, here in the main tent uh, on Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. And uh, Paul is going to be helping us think about why gratitude is so crucial and why we often find it so difficult and how we keep going in the ups and the downs of life. Before Paul preaches, Tony Wilkinson is going to come and, pr- and uh, read Psalm 56 for us. Tony, come and join me. Uh, Tony is part of the steering committee for the Orkney Bible Festival, which is one of the regional uh, Keswick fellowships. So just before you read and Paul preaches, let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you will hold us fast and your word tells us it is so. And so again, as we come under the sound of your word and the preaching of it, would you give us open ears and soft hearts? Would we hear not so much Paul, but would we hear your voice speaking to us as we need it tonight? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Psalm 56. Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise. In God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire. They lurk. They watch my steps, hoping to take my life. Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Amen. Just before we, we get into the passage, I, I was stood at the back there and just listening to the band uh, leading us in He Will Hold Me Fast. And whenever I, I, I hear that song, it reminds me of my uh, daughter, who's just had her 30th birthday. When she was about three or four years old, we'd moved to Worcester and we used to walk up on the, on the Mulvans and uh, wanting to show her independence. And we'd walk along and I'd be holding her hand. She'd say, Daddy, I don't want you to hold my hand. I want to hold your hand, which meant that I put out my finger and she gripped it with her little hand and that was a sign of independence. And that was fine until we got to the dangerous bits, the bits where you could stumble and fall. And at that point I say, darling, you're not going to hold my hand now, I'm going to hold you. And in my great uh, bear's paw, I would take her little hand and hold her firmly and she said, daddy, you're hurting me. No, I'm not. (laughs) I'm holding you fast. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what it's like for you tonight, whether it's difficult to be here, whether it's really 
all sorts of things crowding into your life. And you're kind of thinking, I don't know how I'm going to keep going. I'm just holding on with my fingertips. Listen to me tonight. He holds you. That's the big thing. And he will never let you go. Isn't that good news? Say yes. Yes. Brilliant. Now let's turn to Psalm uh, 56. We're thinking about gratitude and grateful lives this week. And it's very difficult to be grateful when you're afraid. And when David wrote Psalm 56, he was terrified. Things had just come about in his life that had blown him apart. You can read the story in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. If you look at your psalm there, you'll see there's a kind of a little title there before we begin in verse 1. For the director of music attune the dove on distant oaks of David and Mictam when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. Do you remember the story? It was a most difficult time in his life. He'd had a great victory over Goliath. He'd been appointed as the commander of the armies of Israel. And he'd been so successful that they'd put together a little rhyme. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And Saul became jealous. He became paranoid. He tried to kill David. He threw a spear at him. The spear lands in the wall. David runs. Saul lurks. He sends soldiers to lurk outside his house. He's cornered. He runs for his life. He's a fugitive. He loses everything. He loses position and his home and his reputation. He loses his wife and his family. And he's so desperate that he does something that we would consider to be totally bizarre. He runs to the city of Gath, where Achish is the king. Now, if you know anything about Gath, who came from Gath? Goliath. Goliath has got brothers. Do they live in Gath? Well, maybe. There's probably loads of people in Gath who've lost their members of their family to David. Brothers and sons and husbands and fathers. And they they see David arriving and, and they say to the king, they say, look, this is public enemy number one. You know, they they talk about this man. He's killed so many of our relatives. It's almost as if he's got a target on his back. And it says in 1 Samuel 21, David took these words to heart and he was very much afraid. The Hebrew is, he was terrified. He was absolutely overwhelmed and he feigned insanity and then he escaped and ended up in a cave. And in response to that... While he's there, in the midst of all that fear, he writes this psalm. And the psalm is really a journey from fear to faith. And that's the journey that I hope we're going to take this evening. A few years ago, my wife and I were coming home from church. We'd been away. We were down in a a little church in Wiltshire. And it was 8 o'clock in the evening. I know it was 8 o'clock because we were listening to the news and the pips were going. And suddenly my wife screamed because a car was coming towards us on the wrong side of the road. Well, I swerved to avoid it, but I didn't manage to. It hit us and we were spun around in the opposite direction. We ended in in a ditch and the airbags went off. Bang, bang. And then there was silence. And out of the silence, my wife said, are you still alive? And I said, yes, are you? (laughs) And she said, yes. And then she said, you're going to make so many sermon illustrations out of this, aren't you? (laughs) Well, here's two. Number one... We are not in control. We're not in control. We never know what's round the corner. We never know what's going to come over the hill. Our lives are fragile. We can't predict the future. We just don't know. Three years ago, would we have imagined the international catastrophe that is called COVID? A few months ago, would we have imagined for a moment that there would be a a war in Central Europe? No. Could we have imagined that some of us tonight are 
afraid of the winter because we don't even know how we're going to heat our homes. We're fragile, we're in a broken world, we're broken people, and we do not control the future. That's the source of fear. If I knew everything uh, and had everything sorted, I wouldn't need to be afraid. But we don't control the future. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, God does. That's good news, isn't it? You can say yes, it's, it's allowed, okay? Yeah, God does, because that night, it could have been the end of my wife. We, we could be singing in the heavenly choir this evening, and it'd be great, but we're, we're happy to be here. And, uh, <laughs> but here's the point. It was not our time. The psalmist says elsewhere, our times are in God's hands. God's got the future. He's got it all mapped out, and we are safe in his hands. Nothing can touch us without the Lord. Nothing can harm us because he protects his people. He puts a hedge around them. We're in God's hands and therefore we're safe. And I think that that is what this psalm is all about. When David writes this psalm, he knows that he's not in control. He faces dangers left, right and center. If you look through the psalm, he begins by crying for mercy. He says, my enemies are all around me. They're crushing me. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. But that's not where the psalm ends. Like so many of the laments in the Bible, it starts in the darkness, but it works its way through to the light. And it ends, if you look at the very last verse, I know that God will bring me through. I will walk before the Lord in the light of life. He will hold me fast. So tonight we're going to move from the jaws of the enemy into the light of God's presence from fear to faith. I've got just two points this evening. Number one, this is a psalm of honest confession. This is a psalm of honest confession. Look at verse one, please. Be merciful to me, O God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. David begins by crying to God. He doesn't boast of his righteousness. He doesn't bargain with God. He doesn't say, God, you owe me something. He says, God, I need you. I desperately need you. If you take your hand away, I'll fall flat on my face. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Probably you have. I'm sure you have. I need you, Lord. My enemies hotly pursue me. The word is literally they crush me, they squash me, they, they trample on top of me. The Romans had a particular form of torture where they would lie you on your back and pin you down and they'd put a board on your chest, and then they'd begin to put on heavy weights. And, and as the weights became heavier, the harder it began to, became to breathe, until in the end you couldn't breathe anymore, and it would kill you. And sometimes life feels like that. We're crushed. We're overwhelmed. All day long, verse 1, they, 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 they don't give any respite. You know, I go to bed exhausted, I wake up in the early hours of the morning with a sick feeling in my stomach. How am I going to get through today? Look at verse 2. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. They attack him physically. They attack him verbally. They weave a web of lies around him. He, he experiences scorn and derision. No wonder he speaks of his fear in verse 3. Look down at verse 5. All day long. They twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They take my words and they twist them around. They're vindictive. They're vicious. Verse 6, they conspire. They lurk. They watch my steps, hoping to take my life. Verse 7 is interesting, isn't it? Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. There are people who kind of have trouble with the Psalms because of those kind of verses. You know, should we pray for the defeat of our enemies? Is that a kind of an Old Testament thing rather than a New Testament thing? Like the little boy who said, I don't like God in the Old Testament. I prefer him in the New Testament when he became a Christian. But, you know, <laughs> well, don't we pray that prayer? Haven't you prayed that prayer in the last six months? Lord, rescue the people of Ukraine and defeat their enemies. Do you pray for the persecuted church? Number one on the world watch list tonight is Afghanistan, where the church is under the heel of the Taliban. Don't you pray, Lord, 
frustrate their plans, bring down the enemy, rescue your people. I think that's a Christian prayer. I think it's a legitimate prayer. Who is David afraid of? Well, it's Saul, it's the Philistines, it's pretty much everybody. He's in an impossible situation. His enemies are malicious and they're violent and they're devious and they're cunning and they're persistent. The pressure is constant. It's unrelenting, it's real and it's paralyzing. It's not a phantom fear. Some of our fears are phantoms, but some of them are real fears, aren't they? And you have real fears tonight. And David feels alone. He feels isolated. He feels in danger. He feels terrified. And maybe that's where you are tonight. Maybe that sense of overwhelming fear is something you brought to the tent. And maybe you feel a little bit guilty about it. Maybe it's the kind of thing that you don't like to admit. Because there's a brand of Christianity that is very popular these days that has a, a kind of a triumphalism about it. In other words, no Christian should ever admit that they're in trouble. No Christian should ever be afraid. No Christian should ever be sick. No Christian should ever mouth their concerns and their fears. And, and if you're a Christian, you don't go that way. You just kind of pretend everything's okay. When I started in ministry, my first mentor was, a, was an old Baptist minister from Wiltshire. He was, a, he was a, a lovely old guy. His name was Mr. Ebenezer Knight. And he'd been the pastor of a Baptist church in Wiltshire for about 150 years, I think it was, something like that. And uh, his wife was called Florence. So together they were known as Ebb and Flow. <laughs> And I asked Eb one day, Eb, you know, I, I'm, I'm new to this pastoring business. What do I need to know about the Lord's people? What do I really need to know? And he said, you need to know this, that the Lord's people tell lies. That wasn't what I was expecting, I must say. I said, what do you mean, Eb? He said, it, it happens about 12 o'clock on a Sunday lunchtime when you're standing at the door and you're shaking hands and people come out and you say to them, how are you doing? And they say, I'm doing fine, pastor. And you know that their lives are falling apart. Because as Christians, we put on masks. We don't want people to, to know. We don't want to let the side down. Here's what I want you to grasp tonight. It's okay to recognize when you have fears. It's okay to come before the Lord and tell the Lord when you feel that way. Do you know, the, the book of Psalms is wonderful. I'm so pleased I've been asked to preach on Psalms tonight. There are 150 Psalms. Someone said the Psalms are, are the 150 best friends that you'll ever make in your life. And 50 of the Psalms are laments where the, the psalmist comes to God and he cries to God and he said, oh God, help me. I don't know what to do. And they begin very often in the darkness. But almost invariably, the end in the light. It's okay to tell the Lord when you're afraid. What are you afraid of tonight? What's the thing that, that gets you tonight? That diagnosis that arrived just before you came to Keswick. That person who you love so much and you see the beginning of Alzheimer's. They're drifting away from you. They're not the person that they were... They're almost becoming like a, a ghost at the table or a bereavement. Listening to the radio, they were talking to this guy who, who, who'd lost his wife and he said, in the early hours of the morning when I wake up and I reach across in the bed for her because I can't remember in those early hours that she's not there and the bed's not warm anymore. She's gone. Are you afraid of that or retirement or old age or making ends meet, or your marriage is in trouble, or, or you're struggling with your singleness, or, or with your kids. Boy, do we struggle with our kids and our grandkids. Or maybe it's the church. Whatever it is, it's okay to admit it. David does. The Psalms do. And actually, here's the amazing thing. So did Jesus. We kind of think, well, Jesus was superhuman, so he never had those things. He never experienced pain and fear and in John 12, just a few days before the cross, Jesus says, my, my soul is deeply troubled. The, 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 the Greek word is a word that describes a storm at sea, and the storm is raging, and there's this little boat, and it looks as if it's going to go down. And as Jesus contemplates what's going to happen to him on the cross, you know, he's going to be separated from the 
loving smile of his father and the father's going to take the sword of judgment and he's going to plunge it into his own son and as Jesus looks at that, it almost overwhelms him. I'm overcome with it and, and, and in there in the garden, Lord, if there's any other way. And he sweats great drops of blood. Jesus knows. Jesus understands. He's not a far distant saviour. He's close. He stands with you tonight and he will hold you fast. This is a psalm, first of all, of honest confession. But then secondly, this is a psalm of humble confidence. Humble confidence. As we look through this psalm, I want you to see two things that David recognizes as he works through from the dark to the light. Number one, he is in God's hands. He is in God's hands. Look at verse 3. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, and I'm not afraid. What can mortal men do to me? And then he says almost exactly the same a few verses later in verse 10 and verse 11. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I'm not afraid. What can men do to me? He's not denying his fears. He's simply saying, this is what I do with my fears. I come to God, I, I, I cry to God, I, I put these things into God's hands. It's deliberate and it's focused. He kind of takes himself by the scruff of the neck. And sometimes we've got to do that as Christians. I'm going to give these things to God. Remember when Jesus is talking to his disciples just hours before the cross and he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Yeah, no, it's not. It's not a promise. There are promises in the passage. It's a command. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't sit back. Do something. Immerse yourself in God's word. Did you notice three times he says, once in verse 4 and twice in verse 10, your word I praise because where does his confidence come from? It comes from the word of God. When we're afraid, where do we go? We go to truth. We go to this book. In the last three days of his life, when, when my dad was, was struggling with cancer, he was a big bloke like me, and it, and it, it, it had reduced him. And for those last three days, we, we lived in the Psalms. We lived in the Psalms. We lived in the promises of God. We talked about Jesus. We talked about heaven. And, and what held him fast, it was the Savior through the Word. That's why Keswick is so important. That's why we need to, to immerse ourselves in God's word. That's why we need to, to, to take all the resources that, that, that the bookshop can give us to get into God's word because that's where faith is born. That's where faith becomes strong. And as he looks in God's word, what does he discover? Well, what he discovers is that he's in the hands of God. He's not in the hands of Saul. He's not in the hands of Achish. He's not in the hands of the Philistines. He's in the hands of God. Look at the end of verse 4. What can mere mortals do to me? What can man do to me? Because man can't touch me. I'm in the hands of God. He, he says it again slightly differently at the end of verse 11. What can man do to me? Listen to me tonight. You are not in the hands of, of men. Your diagnosis, your troubles with your family or your kids or your church or your finances or whatever it might be, Ultimately, brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian tonight, you are in the hands of Almighty God. Isn't that good news? Amen. Praise the Lord. I mean, come, I could put it like this. God is never taken by surprise. There is never a crisis in heaven. God doesn't have problems. He only has plans. COVID didn't take God by surprise. He didn't kind of fly in under his radar. The Lord knew what he was doing. I don't understand it, but I... I know that God does. You think of when David faces Goliath. You know, there's this man, he's eight foot tall and he's built like a refrigerator. He's armed to the teeth. He's an expert in death. He's a walking, killing machine. And David is a little lad with a catapult and five pebbles. Where does his confidence come from? Well, you might say the great thing about fighting a fridge is that it's a big target. <laughs> but that's not where his confidence comes from. You come against me with sword 
and javelin and spear, I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. And David doesn't blink because he knows he's in God's hands. And that great picture, that great Old Testament picture, of course, ultimately is the picture of a greater victory. There is Jesus and he comes and and like little David, he looks so weak and feeble and pathetic and they arrest him and they beat him so he can barely stand. They they take him out to Calvary, they've stripped him naked, he's a man abandoned. He can't even carry in his own cross anymore. And they throw him to the ground and they nail him and, and, and he hangs there like, a, like a, a, a haunch of beef. In Psalm 22, he says, I, I'm even, not even a man anymore. I'm like a worm. He's so weak. He's so feeble. He's so utterly pathetic. He hasn't got a chance. And what does he do? He absolutely triumphs. After the six hours of suffering, he shouts with a loud voice, finished, accomplished, done forever. And three days later, up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. Death is conquered. Love has won. Christ has triumphed. Excuse me. Hallelujah. He is the Lord. And we are in Christ We are in the hands of God. We're in the hands of the Savior. He's won every battle we will ever have to face. And by faith, we come and we take hold of him. When I'm afraid, I will trust him. What can man do to me? Do you notice that he does it twice? Why does he repeat it? Is it just because he was forgetting what to say? He needed something else to say, so repeat yourself like, you know, like preachers do. (laughs) Do you know why he does it twice? Because faith zigzags, doesn't it? Yeah, we see God's word, we believe God's word, we come to a meeting like this, we feel great, and then the fears come flooding back. And so what do we have to do? We have to say, no, 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 I'm not going to believe the fears. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe in God. And, And faith zigzags across. And all the time we come back to, yes, I will trust him. I'm in the hands of God. What can man do to me? What can cancer do to me? What can COVID do to me? What can circumstances do to me? What can a world that hates God do to me? What, what can, what can the, this, whole, this whole panoply of Satan do to me? Nothing. Because God is Lord and Jesus has triumphed and the Holy Spirit dwells in me. He will hold me fast. First great thing that David realizes is that he's in the hands of God. But the second great thing that David realizes, and if anything this is even more amazing, he's on God's heart. He's on God's heart. Look at verse 8. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Now, now, there's there's some debate as to what exactly verse 8 means. But what is clear is that when it comes to his tears, God knows all about them. And it's either that God writes them on a scroll or God collects them in a bottle. Whatever it is, every time David prays to God. Every time God, uh, David weeps before the Lord, God writes it down, or God collects the tears. God knows. There's nothing more personal and private than tears. Isn't that right? Those moments when we're just overwhelmed. Those moments when we don't know where to turn. And the only response we can offer is to weep. Now my little grandson Abraham was born. He was a bonny lad. And within a few weeks, we discovered that he had a, a, a dreadful neurological condition, which meant that, that his life expectancy was very short. He was blind. He would never speak or have any higher functions. I've got to say, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a Brummie, and Brummies don't cry very much. And that's what I was taught as a, as a lad, but I wept. I wept silently. I was driving to London at the time when the news came through, and I had to stop the car on a service station because I couldn't go on. I, I just wept. 
And God took those bitter tears and he collected them in his bottle. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who is compassionate. We have a God who is amazingly tender. What a friend we have in Jesus. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our trials share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. He's not a God far off. He's a God who has lived on this planet. He's a God who ate a meal and went for a walk. He's a God who became hungry and thirsty. He stubbed his toe. He hit his thumb with a hammer. He rejoiced at a wedding and wept at a funeral. He knew what it was to be deserted and denied and beaten and abused and nailed to a cross. He knew what it was to be tortured to death. And the Bible says that having done that, he ascended to heaven. Having risen from the dead, he ascended to heaven and he is interceding for his people. Here's the great thing. Tonight, tonight, at this moment in time, Christian, he's praying for you. Does that blow your mind? Does that, does that, does that just slightly encourage you? Does it make you think, wow, with all my needs, he's not, he's not looking at a distance and thinking, oh, it's nothing. He's praying for you. He's holding you up before his father. When I was a kid, I used to watch Perry Mason. Who remembers Perry Mason? You've got to be over... A hundred to remember Perry Mason, okay? <laughs> you just dated yourselves. Well done. Perry Mason, for those young people who've never heard of him, was a, he was a, one of these uh, American programs. And Perry Mason was a, was a lawyer, and, and the story was always the same, always the identical story, always the same. They went to court. The person was going to be found guilty. Perry Mason comes in 10 minutes from the end. He finds the most amazing evidence, and the person walks free. He never loses a case. He wins every time. And I remember as a kid thinking, if ever I get in trouble, I want Perry Mason. Because <laughs> he never loses. <laughs> Listen to me, Jesus never loses. He's never lost a case yet. Not once. Not one of his children has ever fallen away. Not one of his disciples has ever gone from him ultimately because he brings us back. If, if we sin, he'll chasten us because sin's a big thing. He won't, he won't let us get away with sin. Our Father will never let us go. He'll never let us down and he'll never let us off either. But he's praying for you tonight. And so look at how, Paul, uh, how David takes it from there. I said Paul because the words almost echo Paul, don't they? Look at verse 9. When my enemies will turn back, when I call for help, by this I know that God is for me. I know that God is for me. God is on my side. God will not let me go. He will hold me fast. We, we, we read these words earlier. Do you remember? Verse 31 of Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is on my side and he's compassionate and he knows my trials and my troubles and my fears and he knows all those things, and if he is for me, who can be against me? And the assumption is nobody. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against the Lord's chosen? It's God who justifies. And so on, and so on, and so on. We're more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. We are safe. We are forgiven. We are secure in the hands of Almighty God. Tonight you're on God's heart. I, I should pause there for a moment and say, if you are not a Christian tonight, then none of these things are true. In fact, dare I say this, and, and this may sound harsh and hard, God is against you. He's not for you. Why? Because you're against God. You're fighting him. And listen to me, you can't beat him. To become a Christian is to, to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. It's, it's what we did or thought about last night. It's stopping hiding the sin and simply saying, forgive me, have mercy on me. I turn from my sin, I turn to you. Look at how David concludes the psalm. This is coming out of the out of the darkness into the light. Verse 12, I'm under vows to you, God. I will present my thank you offering to you. David's saying, I I'm going to make the offerings I promised. While I was in trouble, I cried to you, Lord, and now I want to show that, that, that I, I, I'm grateful. I, I'm full of gratitude for what you've done. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling that I may walk before God in the light of life. Now, now there's some debate about when David wrote those words. Some people think it's a P.S., 
you know, he's written the most part of the psalm, and then when he, gets a, when he escapes and he gets to the cave of Adullam, then he's writing these words as a kind of a memory and saying, yes, now I've been saved. I don't think so. I think God's, when he writes it, he's still in Garth. What he's saying is that my, my security is so sure, I know that God will bring me through. I know that God will save me. I know that he'll protect me. And David knew that because God had promised he'd be king. God does not promise us that he will take us through all the trials of this life and we'll, we'll not die. For some of us, that may be what God has for us. Some of us may not be here next, next year. But here's the great truth. We go through death to glory, which is what Jesus did. He came through death into the light of his Father's glory and he has promised his people he will hold us, he will take us to himself and one day he'll raise us from the dead and we'll be with him forever. That's our ultimate hope. That's our ultimate glory. This world fears and troubles and trials. The next world, eternal glory with Christ. And we can trust him totally. He will hold us fast. As we finish, I hope you'll forgive me for, for sharing a, a personal testimony. I mentioned my daughter right at the beginning. She was 30 years old on the 1st of July this month, 30 years. Uh, and that was very significant for my wife and myself because it was exactly 30 years ago when Edry was carrying Emmaus, but she became ill. And she's been ill now for 30 years. She's been in a wheelchair for 30 years. And, and what you don't see is the pain, which is, which is uh, an accompaniment of her illness virtually every night for, for a decade. And I remember when, 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 when the doctor told us, she may not make it, she may not get through this. And I was kind of combing my daughter's hair, and, and, and you know, for various reasons, I'm not particularly good at combing hair. And uh, I was kind of macheting away and... <laughs> And she burst into tears, and then I burst into tears as well. And she said, what's the matter, Daddy? And I said, I just want Mommy back. I just want her as she was. And I went to bed that night, and you know, it's like you wake up at 3 in the morning, and you know you're not going to sleep. I felt sick. And as I analyzed my thoughts, it was absolute terror. Because I, I, I'd got my life sorted, and here was the darling of my life, and I didn't know what was going to happen. She died. What would happen to the other kids? What would happen to her? What would happen? And, and I, I, just, I just was terrified. And I cried to God. And, and for a couple of hours, I tossed and turned. And then suddenly out of, well, I was going to say out of nowhere, out of heaven, the voice of the Holy Spirit brought a verse into my heart, just a fragment of a verse, Psalm 18, verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. In other words, whatever, whatever is going to happen, you don't have to work it out. You don't have to control it. You don't have to be the boss. I'll look after it. Trust me. And then I did something amazing. I fell asleep. <laughs> because God had filled my heart with peace. Next day, I shared it with Edry. And we prayed, Lord, we don't know what the future holds. But we know you're in charge, Lord. And so what we ask you now is use this. Use this experience. Whatever it is and however it turns out for your glory, so that we can serve you. And I look back, and this is 30 years now, and I say to you tonight, the Lord has answered that prayer a thousand times. More than anything we could have contemplated or imagined, God has answered that prayer. He has used trial and trouble and fear and, and, and all of those things to minister to us and to minister into the lives of other people. He's held us fast. We were always in his plans. You are always in his plans. You're safe in his hands and you're precious to him because you're on his heart. What do we do with fear? Well, we confess it and then we turn to God and we hold him. But more than that, he holds us. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much tonight that we are secure in Christ that he's won the battle already and that he will hold us fast. Help us to persevere and to keep going, to not give up. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and begin to respond to what we've heard.
Righteous storms within us rage. We will fear the Lord when death, disease, and darkness reign. We will fear the Lord. All things will bow at His command to bring us good from what would harm. We rest secure in sovereign arms. We take seats. We've heard a really powerful word uh, tonight, haven't we? It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to feel afraid. God sees every tear. Uh, and maybe as Paul described, you, you feel like you're doing that zigzag of fear and faith uh, on a daily, maybe moment by moment basis. Can I really encourage you to come and pray about that tonight? If that's you, maybe, maybe this is something new, maybe it's something been on your heart, you've, you've just not yet kind of really opened up and, and, and prayed with someone about it. We've got a prayer team here ready, down at the front, on the right-hand side. If, uh, if what Paul said has just 
hit you like a freight train tonight. Maybe that's God speaking to you, actually. Come and pray. Come and talk. Come and weep. Come and lament. God will see every bit and hold you fast all the way. Come and pray. And if you're watching online and you'd like us to pray for something, there's, there's an email there, prayer at keswickministries.org. Feel free to send those in and we can pray for those too. There's also going to be another prayer meeting in the morning at 8.45 in Base Camp PH1. These are on every morning. It um, be great to come and pray for the convention and, and um, the work in the wider world as well. Um, so do join us for that. Um, but as we close this evening, let me pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of meeting as your people. Thank you for teaching us through your word this evening. And Father, thank you that it's such good news that we're in your hands because you're powerful and you're good. And thank you that it's such good news that we're on your heart, that you're compassionate and you see and you know. Lord, please um, remind us of that afresh this evening. Help us to remember it as we leave. And Lord, please help us to be honest with you and with us as about our fears. And Lord, please help us to trust you. Amen.
My great redeemer's praise, my great. 